Hi, welcome to Strange Loop. Hope everyone had coffee. Um, welcome to my talk. Um, my name's Ian. Uh, I use he/him pronouns. Um, I am originally from Australia, but now I live near San Francisco with my wife and kids. Um, I think of myself as a startup person, but I've been at Google for over 10 years and spent um, the last seven or so working on Fuchsia. So maybe I'm not really anymore, but you know. Uh, that's how I think of myself. Um, so what is Fuchsia? Um, here's what it says on our website, fuchsia.dev. Fuchsia is a modern open source operating system that's simple, secure, updatable, and performant. Cool, that's all true, um, but Fuchsia is not the only operating system that um, has these goals. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we go about um, reaching these goals. Um, so a big part of how we do this um, is through uh, the way we describe the boundaries between the different parts of our system. Um, what I've worked on for most of my time on Fuchsia is a system called Fiddle, the Fuchsia Interface Definition Language. Um, I'm going to skim over some of the technical details of Fiddle um, because I think what's more interesting is how it fits into the system and what the implications of using this single language for describing the interactions between the different parts of the system are. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about Fuchsia, because we need to understand the type of problem we're trying to solve to understand how we're solving it. So Fuchsia is an open source operating system. Um, it's permissively licensed. Um, it's mostly developed by people who work for Google, but there are some external contributors. Um, running an open source project from within a big company, or any company really, is hard. Um, it's really hard to do well, um, but we think it's really important, so we put a bunch of effort into doing it. Um, we have like an open bug tracker, the source is all open. Um, we've recently, in the last couple of years, adopted an open RFC system for making, for the decision making about making technical changes that's based fairly closely on the way that Rust does things. Um, so that's, that the openness is, a, is an important thing to us. Um, it's not a toy operating system. It doesn't just run on an emulator. It runs on real hardware. Um, it's the basis for a bunch of the Fuchsia um, Home Hub smart display products. Um, it runs on 64-bit ARM and x86. The, someone is, has it running on, uh, on RISC-V, though we haven't got that in mainline yet, um, mostly because we haven't got a way to, run, to test it continuously. We have GPU accelerated Vulkan drivers. We have a full Wi-Fi stack. We have Bluetooth. Um, it's a real operating system that can do real things, which is pretty cool. Um, it's hard to get there. Um, we didn't take an existing system, existing kernel like Linux or Mac or VMS, and then adapt it to solve the problems we were trying to solve. We built it from scratch. Um, we took. Uh, a tiny embedded kernel called LK that some of the people that we work with had written pri previously and then built that into a microkernel. Um, um, one of our tech leads on the kernel side um, calls it a pragmatic microkernel. Um, Zircon is the name of the, the kernel. Um, it's a pragmatic microkernel because we're not trying to achieve some kinds of um, academic purity. You know, the, LK, the, the L4 microkernel has seven syscalls. Linux has 300 syscalls. We have about 150. So we're in between. The point is not to um, prove something. The point is to solve the problems that we're setting out to solve. And using a microkernel is a great way to do that. So the most significant thing that's different in our kernel versus user space architecture um, than other operating systems you might be familiar with is that all the device drivers, all the file systems, the network stack, all of that stuff is all in user space. Um, this is great for security because it means your mouse driver doesn't need, or your, say your, your keyboard driver doesn't need to be running in ring zero and have the ability to DMA anywhere in memory. Um, but it does mean that you need really good isolation between the different components in user space. Because whilst your device drivers don't um, have access, have privileged kernel access, they do have access to hardware. They are potentially dealing with um, information from different, um, different parts of your system that should not 
be able to interact. Um, so that informs a lot of our uh, user space security model. Um, so we have, uh, we, use, we have an abstraction we call components. So uh, again, on our website, I'm quoting ourselves a little bit, uh, components are the common abstraction that define how all software is described, sandboxed, and executed on a Fuchsia system. Uh, they're roughly equivalent to processes, although slightly not the same, and I'm gonna ignore that for now because that's another talk. Um, it's interesting, but that's another talk. Um, they're organized into a hierarchy. Every process, every component has a parent. Um, and they are sandboxed by default. There's no ambient authority. When you start a new component, it doesn't have access to files, it doesn't have access to the network, it doesn't have access to the screen. It only has access to the things that it parent, its parent chooses to give it. Um, this is kind of weird when you're coming from a Unix background where you have slash and you, you restrict access to a component on your system by saying, by taking things away. Uh, in the Fuchsia model, you decide how much access a component has by giving it things that it's allowed to have. Um, um, so how do we give access to things? Um, we use, the terms we use are handles and capabilities. Handles are kind of like file descriptors. They're a number in your process that you pass to the kernel when you're making a system call. So you, um, they, they represent access, uh, a set of rights to access certain kernel resources. So those can be um, shared memory or an IPC channel or um, a, a socket, a network socket, um, or it can be a thing like um, a virtual memory region or an interrupt or DMA rights. Because we have um, drivers in user space, we need to expose a bunch of the things that drivers need to user space through handles. Um, semantically, we, don't, we talk about capabilities. So uh, capabilities are represented by a handle typically. So if that's a region of shared memory or an interrupt, it's basically this just a handle to that thing. Um, but when we think about capabilities to talk to other services, that's uh, an IPC channel um, that has an associated protocol that runs over it. So, um, you can imagine the protocol for accessing the keyboard gives you hit events or something when you talk to it. Um, the protocol for accessing the file system lets you open files and things like that. Um, and those happen all over these IPC channels. Uh, IPC stands for inter-process communication. I realized at the last minute that I didn't define that anywhere. Um, it's the idea that processes have to communicate and this is the general term for it. Um, Bring your own runtime is another little slogan we tell ourselves, an internal a goal. Um, we don't pick winners f in terms of what programming environment and language um, is used on Fuchsia. Um, we, have, we have customers now and we wanna be able to have other customers and, and meet them where they are. They have existing code. Um, they have, they're solving different classes of problem which might inform the kinds of programming languages and runtime environments they want. Um, so we don't want to have like a, a blessed, like the right way to write things. Um, and so if you're writing uh, an iOS or Mac OS app and you're not using Objective-C or Swift, you're gonna have a, like a little impedance mismatch when you're trying to call system APIs. Same for Android, if you're not using Kotlin or, or Java, you, there's some APIs that are hard to get to. Like the Windows like .NET world is kind of cool because you can have any language, but only languages that can run on the .NET runtime. So if it's F sharp or, um, or C-sharp, um, that's fine, but if you've got some weird other esoteric language you really wanna use, you've gotta build some kind of bridge. Um, for us, if you want to run, a, if you wanna use a particular language or runtime on your operating system, on Fuchsia, you should be able to use it. All you have to do is, is bring it and then it becomes a first class supported language. So, how do we do that? Um, all of our APIs and ABIs are defined in terms of Fiddle. We have this single language that, lets, um, that we use to describe how any of the components of the system communicate to each other. And that means if you write your component in a new language, you just have to implement Fiddle, and then you can talk to anything on the system, um, as well as anything else. You know, we, um, we write a lot of C++ and Rust, 
to implement the operating system, but that's because those are good languages for implementing an operating system. Um, the higher level code that runs in it, there's a lot of that that's written in Dart. We have code that's written in Go. Um, and we can choose the best language for the best task. Um, as a disclaimer, this is only mostly true uh, right now, that all APIs are defined in Fiddle. Um, we're getting there more and more. Um, so Fiddle itself, what is it? Um, it's, a, it's a language for describing data types and um, protocols. Um, it's similar to protobuf, flat buffers, corba if you're old like me, um, and so on. It's got all your basic integer types, um, floats, booleans, strings, variable and fixed length lists. Um, then we have user defined types. You can have enums and bit fields, um, tagged unions, kind of like Rust's enum. Um, we've got a couple of different record types, and I'll describe a little more later why we have two different ones. One of them is more rigid and fixed, and one is more flexible. Um, and then we have protocols, which are how we describe the, um, this interaction between two components that can happen over an IPC channel. Um, and we have API versioning built in, which we've just been adding as we've been maturing our SDK. Um, so that way, when you are evolving your APIs, the support for that is built into the language. Um, why do we not use something existing that already had lots of tooling and, and lots of support? The, the fundamental reason is that because handles and capabilities are key to the way that Fuchsia works, um, they need to be built into the language and built into the, the whole system. So we, we built our own. Um, so here's a little bit of fiddle. Um, it's a short example. This one shows you're declaring a new library, make a constant, 64-bit int unsigned integer constant. Um, the triple slash comment means that it's going to be a doc comment, so it'll end up being in generated documentation and generated code. Um, there's a union, there's an enum and a, a bit field. Um, the, one of them is marked flexible and one is marked strict. That really determines where the, um, the error checking happens. Um, and so, you know, if you declare something strict, then the, op the system will reject messages that don't, that don't match. Um, uh, whereas if it's flexible, then the code that uses them has to, has to do that interpretation. So that kind of comes into when you're working out how, what ev your evolution story is going to be. Uh, here is um, a struct and a table and a union. So these, the first two are these record types. Um, the struct is just very, it's a very fixed memory layout. So if you change anything about it, um, that's a backwards incompatible change. Whereas with a table, you can um, add and remove fields at will. Um, the balance being you need to then um, actually validate that when you receive a table, it has the things you want in it. Um, uh, and then the union at the bottom where you can pick, it's one of those values. Fairly kind of ordinary stuff. Um, um, and then there's a protocol definition. So this is a simple protocol for playing tic-tac-toe. Um, there's three kinds of methods on it here. The first one is um, a one-way method, so it's um, client initiated, so the client sends a message to the server which has a boolean in it. Uh, the second is, is a two-way method, so the client sends a message to the server, server responds with the new state um, or an error. Um, and having this error handling be in the protocol definition lets us then um, handle that idiomatically in different languages. So in Rust, it's a, res a result enum. In Dart, it's an exception, things like that. Um, and then finally, we've got uh, event. So those are server-initiated messages, which are often useful um, for modeling an interesting, interesting system. Um, so the wire format is, is sort of interesting. Um, when we started Fuchsia, we had two different IPC systems. We had one that was low level um, that was used for like file IO and was developed by like our kernel team. And then there was a higher level one that was more like protobuf, more flexible, um, that was developed more on the app side. And we decided to unify them when we made Fiddle. Um, and to convince the kernel developers that yes, that was a good idea, we had to make Fiddle as efficient as their hand-rolled C-struct based thing. Um, and so the wire format is 
compatible with C structs. So you can read a fiddle message in and then basically cast it to a generated C type or C++ type and use it in place. Um, that makes for very cheap encode and decode. You don't need to do any memory allocation, which is important for us because there are places we use fiddle where um, memory allocation is expensive or not even available. Uh, it's good data locality um, so that you get good cache performance um, and it's as fast as hand rolled. Uh, more recently, the team that works on our graphics stack um, was looking at how to improve the performance um, of their like GPU pipeline and they use Fiddle for sending messages through to the GPU. And so they looked at building their own custom system for this very specific use case. Uh, that was very performance critical. And they tried to make something that was faster than what we have, and what we do with Fiddle, and they couldn't. So it's pretty good for that. Um, and one interesting thing is that each message has uh, a unique ID determined by its name. It's like a hashed thing. So uh, given a message that you that sent over a, uh, an IPC channel, you can work out where that fits in, like whether that's a request for a particular um, API or not. Um, the way we actually turn that source code into something useful um, is we have a front end compiler called Fiddle C that takes your source code and then turns it into this intermediate JSON representation. Um, that contains all the semantic information about these are the types and this is what their names are and these are the comments about the doc comments about them and all that kind of stuff. Um, but also it goes down to like how do you lay that out in the wire format. Um, which is great because then when you generate your backends, so we have code generators for all of the, the backends we have, um, those, um, they don't have to reinvent or get the, have the same um, wire format calculation behavior because that's actually included in the, in the intermediate representation. Um, and then the intermediate representation is useful for lots of other things. So we've built our documentation generator tool on that. Um, I've built like prototypes of dynamic language bindings that just read the intermediate representation and at runtime can do, can generate messages and do dispatch. Um, so having that IR that's machine readable and optimized for building tools on has been a great thing for us. Um, so how do you actually use it? You need a binding because you're not going to write fiddle messages directly. We have language bindings in C++, Rust, and Dart, and Go that we support. Like I mentioned, I've prototyped some for some dynamic languages, which were fun. Um, each language mostly consists of a code generator that takes the IR and then generates some source files, um, and a support library that is like, OK, how do I take a C++ string and turn it into a Fiddle formatted string? Um, and how do I set up and maintain these connections in a semantically nice way? Um, We've built a bunch of conformance tests because it's really hard to maintain a bunch of language bindings that actually all work together. Um, so we have really extensive conformance tests for the wire format and increasingly um, extensive conformance tests for like the interaction model. So like, what do you do when you receive a message that's unexpected? Like we want all the language bindings to behave consistently. Um, and having these tests has allowed, has really made it a lot easier for us to move more quickly, innovating, to add more languages, this kind of thing. Um, Definitely testing good, turns out, who knew? Um, there's a bunch of, there's an ecosystem of tooling. And like I said, a lot of this is based on that IR format. So we have a linter and we have a formatter that work on the source code. Every language should have those. Uh, a documentation generator. Um, and because all of our APIs are specified in Fiddle, this documentation generator lets us generate um, consistent documentation on the Fuchsia Dev website for every programming, for every interface to the system. Um, we have pretty good IDE support. Um, because everyone on, who works on Fuchsia and with Fuchsia uses Fiddle all day, everyone ends up getting syntax highlighting working in their editor, because otherwise, you know, what year is this? We need syntax highlighting. Um, then there's a couple, of, there's a few really interesting tools. Um, there's one called, well, I'm going to go through the last three on this slide with some um, screenshots. Um, it's Fiddlebolt, which is kind of named after Godbolt. Um, I don't know if this is terribly impossible to read. It is, I think. Um, so it, you, t you can put in some Fiddle source code. This is a web app. And then it will run all the back ends and 
show you the output. So this is the intermediate representation for this little um, snippet. Uh, and then the switch tabs. And there's the um, generated Rust code. So you can see that the, if you can see, probably cannot because it's too small. Um, the documentation comment goes over. You can see that, um, or you could see if it wasn't so small, um, that the fiddle struct gets reflected over as a um, Rust struct, and then with some additional metadata about how to encode it. Um, and so that's a really useful tool for understanding how the, the fiddle specifications that you write manifest themselves um, in the target languages. Um, then we have um, a thing called FiddleViz. Um, similar, this is kind of the branding that my colleague Mitchell Kember has, because he wrote both these tools. This lets you visualize the um, wire format. So you can type in kind of a high level representation for what data types you want to encode, and then it just gives you a visual view of what that actually ends up looking like. Um, again, for understanding what's happened or like understanding what the size of a particular data type you're trying to describe is, um, that's, this is super useful. Um, uh, finally, Fiddlecat is super cool. So it's basically like TCP dump or Wireshark, but for your IPC messages. So what it will do is it will intercept this, all the syscalls that a particular process is making um, and print out what they are and then decode, if they represent a fiddle message being sent or received, they will, it will decode it and tell you exactly what all those things are. So the first one at the top is a, um, a request coming in to open a node in a directory. Uh, and then the second one is actually sending a message to that node that um, is a hello st echo string message with a, with a value in it. So this is really awesome for debugging. Uh, and because we use this consistent approach for all of our IPC, all of our APIs, you can see basically everything a process is doing by um, using Fiddlecat on it. Um, so what do we use it for? I said it's for everything. It's kind of, it's really for just about everything. Um, our system call layer, so the layer between, that describes how user space and the kernel communicate is specified in terms of Fiddle. Um, right now, it doesn't use the Fiddle wire format for the, that interaction, but we're working on using, moving to using the Fiddle wire format um, so that it really is just kind of like Fiddle. It doesn't go over an IPC channel because like the IPC channel to, to write to an IPC channel, you make a syscall. So, but it, um, it's going to be very consistent in that way. Um, because device drivers, file systems, and all that are in user space, all of those interfaces are done over Fiddle. Um, the core system IPC, like different components within the system talking to each other, you know, the two, two halves of the Wi-Fi stack, the policy and like the state machine, they talk over Fiddle. Um, all your system APIs, so anything your like, app will use to write to the screen, read from the keyboard, you know, uh, talk to a database. That's all over Fiddle um, between different applications as well. So basically all of the inter-component communication is all using Fiddle. Um, we're starting to use it more for file formats because we have this way of describing um, data types that is shared across the whole system that all the programmers are used to. Um, we're using that for persisting data and also for like data that ships as part of this part of the system build. Um, something I'm working on soon is trying to move our component interfaces to being in Fiddle. So right now we have a JSON format that describes how your program interacts with other things, what protocols it uses and what capabilities it uses and provides. Um, and we're looking at moving that to Fiddle. It's a higher level, it's a higher level interface. Um, so it's sort of extending what we're what the scope of the language is. Um, but we've had such a good experience using Fiddle for everything else. It seems to be a good move. Um, so is this unusual? Like, how about other operating systems? Um, this is a, just off, mostly off the top of my head, thinking about how programs or components of the Linux system communi communicate. Uh, this is a lot of things. I'm not actually going to talk through them all. Um, but like system calls are defined as like there's a basically a big enumeration in sys syscall.h and then there's the structs that the kernel defines that user space uses. Uh, device drivers and file systems in the kernel, they use like a V table, like a struct of pointers model. Um, then um, you've got um, lots of 
dbus um, and sort of domain specific binary protocols all over the place through the stack either like uh, you know t running talking to systemd i think that's largely over dbus um, you know if you're talking to postgres or something you're talking a binary protocol over unix domain socket same for x windows um, and these are all like optimized for their specific use cases I kind of think of them as like domain specific languages versus a general purpose language. Um, and so for each of these use cases, arguably they are better suited than a more general purpose thing like Fiddle would be. Um, the balance is that if you want to talk X windows, you need to implement that protocol in your programming language or you need to bind the C libraries for it um, rather than being able to generate something automatically. Um, so, how is this, this difference working out for Fuchsia? Um, we have common, it gives us a common type system. Fiddle gives us a common type system across the whole, the whole um, stack. So when you want to talk about a 32-bit unsigned integer, you say uint 32. You know, a Rust programmer would say u32, a C++ programmer might say um, uint 32t, um, but like we have a common language for the basic types. Um, we also can define types that are shared across the whole stack. So you know, here's a simple definition of a, what a MAC address might be represented as, um, and you can use the same data type when you're writing the Ethernet driver, and you can, as when you're building a GUI app that shows you what Wi-Fi network you're connected to. You can pass that data all the way through. You could persist it to disk. Um, and then you can also write uh, libraries that operate on these types too. So you could imagine something that formats MAC addresses or parses them. And you could share that between different layers of the stack. Um, but different layers of the stack have different performance constraints and different evolution needs. So um, one of the places that this is most obvious and visible in in Fuchsia and in the Fiddle language is that we have these two different record types. Struct, which is rigid and compact and can be decoded and encoded really, really efficiently, um, but that you can't um, modify very much without breaking backwards compatibility. Um, versus table, which is um, more expressive and easier to evolve, but less efficient computationally and space-wise. Um, we've mostly been able to manage not having too much duplication. This is the one where it just really sticks out as, as actually um, something that developers have to think about. Um, it ends up being a bit of a cognitive load, but that's balanced by having a single language for everything. Um, we have the same language bindings across the whole stack. So if you write a device driver in Rust, or the GUI app in Rust, it's the same, you write it in the same way. You write this, use the same libraries. Um, if you're um, reviewing code of someone that's working elsewhere in the stack, you can actually understand what it is because they're not using something weird and esoteric and different. Um, if you need to, if you want to work on a feature vertically, it's going to be far more consistent than, uh, than it might otherwise be. Um, but there are trade-offs, right? So. Um, for C++, we have two different flavors of our bindings. One that sticks very tightly to the, um, the, the wire format so we can avoid allocation and, and work very efficiently. Um, and then one that works more with C++ idiomatic data types. Because when you're restricted to just using the wire format, um, it makes memory management a little weird. Uh, you have to be, there are more foot guns. Um, so we have two versions of the, of the C++ APIs that interoperate well, but like, it, it's a bigger surface area than just a single set of bindings to, for a single purpose. Um, we also have like async and sync flavors of various of our bindings. So for I think Rust and C++, you can either um, rely on like an async loop that's built into your program or you can block the, your, your thread for each, for each operation. And so that kind of grows, that makes the, um, that makes the system larger and more, more difficult to necessarily hold all in your head at once um, in order to satisfy these different requirements that come from different kinds of use cases. Um, 
the versioning system is across, common across all of the APIs. So um, I didn't put it in any of the source code examples, but basically you can declare when, uh, what version new, new declarations were introduced and when they were removed. Um, that way, um, that allows our SDK to be uh, the same SDK that we ship to be used at different versions, and then people can get different versions of the APIs depending on um, where they're at, and um, that allows kind of us to update the SDK without forcing our, our, ex our external developers to update their usages of it instantly. Um, so that's pretty cool that we, because we have this single way of describing APIs, we have a single way of doing API versioning. Uh, it's great for the SDK team. They're not chasing down all kinds of different weird things. It's great for developers because they only have to worry about one version number. Um, um, but like we, there's different evolution needs. You know, in the conversations we've been having with the kernel team about the, um, the syscall layer that we're working on, syscalls change very slowly. We raise, they want to do certain things and we're like, that might be really hard to change. And they're like, this is never changing. Like, if this changes, it's like, we're, we're in a whole new world. So um, in a way, you end up with a little bit of a, there's, there's this balance of lowest common denominator versus like not meeting these very well. And we, I think we're doing all right with this. Um, but it's one of these, one of these ongoing um, challenges with doing things one way. Um, this is one of my favorite things about it, is that because everything is fiddle, like there's one way to talk to everyone. There's one sort of API abstraction. Um, you know, if you're in Rust, everything, every API is a Rust async API because they're all going through the same set of generated bindings and the same set of bindings libraries. You know, if you're writing Dart, then every error return comes back as an exception because that's how you do it in Fiddle. And we map the, the, the error returns in Fiddle methods to exceptions. So that gives you a lot more consistency between your different APIs. When you're working on other systems where you have different ways of interacting with different APIs, you end up having to this sort of impedance mismatch sometimes between different kinds of APIs. Um, you know, uh, traditionally, like if you want asynchronous I.O., you spawn a new thread because all of your POSIX I.O. is blocking. And so you need to have threads, worker threads, to do your I.O. in an asynchronous manner. Um, because everything we do is through the same fiddle interface, we can avoid those kinds of um, sort of weird abstractions. Um, supporting a new runtime is straightforward. You just implement fiddle, which is not nothing. Like, it's a big, it's a fairly big language. It has, it supports a lot of different use cases. Um, but we have really good documentation, or good documentation, and really good tests. Um, and um, once you've implemented it, you've got access to everything. You have access to every API in the system. You can write any kind of application that can run anywhere in the stack. Um, and so that, um, that is kind of this, one of these superpowers. You can, if you want to write Haskell device drivers, then all you have to do, all you have to do is implement Fiddle, um, which is not nothing, but like once you've done it, it's there, it's good. Um, and there's sort of a force multiplication effect as well. So those tools I was showing you earlier, because they work with Fiddle, they work everywhere. They work for every API. They work for drivers through to GUI programs, through to syscalls. Um, so anytime you invest in Fiddle tooling and in the Fiddle ecosystem, it pays off bigger than it would otherwise, um, which is cool. It's a good excuse. Um, but on the other hand, Every change we want to make to the Fiddle system, we need to think about every single use case because we don't want to make anyone, we don't want to make anything worse. Um, we have a concept, um, maybe I should have made a slide about this. We have an idea called only pay for what you use. So the idea being if we add some feature that is useful for some use case, it shouldn't make any of the other use cases worse. Um, so we have to consider all the other use cases when that happens. Um, Similarly, in terms of language features, we have to be careful about not um, introducing fiddle language features that are hard to bind idiomatically to any of the programming languages we want to support. Um, I remember at some point, we've talked off repeatedly about introducing kind of like a map type, like a dictionary, whatever. Um, 
And then someone points out, well, you can't have, in Rust, you can't have floating points as keys. So like, okay, well, that's a constraint we need to think about. But we wouldn't have thought about that if we hadn't been aware of, of, of Rust. And so we need to think about not only what languages we support today, but what language we might want to support in the future and not add features that can't be idiomatically expressed nicely. Um, so it's all about balance. Um, the, the fun part, the best part of Fiddle for me is that I have to think about all the different problems in the system. Um, I said at the start that I'm like a startup person uh, and like the thing I like about startups is you, you do everything. You go in there and there's a whole bunch of problems to solve. So we get together in a room and we try and solve them. It's awesome and it's fun. Um, as projects get more mature, as teams grow, you're most likely to specialize and work on a little piece of the stack. Um, but the piece of the stack I work on is the bit that ties everything together. So I have to, and I get to, talk to people working on the kernel, people working on GUI apps, people working on the Wi-Fi stack, everyone. And I have to understand the kinds of problems they're trying to solve, and I have to help them solve those problems, which is, I think, the part of it that I really love. Um, um, and like Fiddle is about people, ultimately, too. You know, there's, Fiddle describes how pieces of code communicate, but it also describes how people communicate and collaborate. So it, um, it's the language when, when, two, when two teams are trying to work out how their products, their parts of the product are going to interact, there'll be a code review on a Fiddle library or it's changes to a Fiddle library. And that's where they will have that discussion about how their code can interact. Um, and so it's really a human language almost as much it is, as it is a computer language. Um, so that's sort of my, my riff on IPC for the whole operating system. Um, we use this one system to describe all of the different ways that different components in the system can interact. Um, and that is really powerful, but it is a balancing act, which I happen to like. Um, does anyone have questions? Uh, the question was, is there any relationship between this IPC system and Mojo, which Chromium uses? The answer is yes. Um, the original IPC system in Fuchsia, the higher level one, was Mojo, but it was a fork of Mojo that had happened. And so we had to change the name because it was very, getting very confusing that there was Mojo and Mojo, and they were different. Uh, and then we made Chromium run on Fuchsia, and then there were two things called Mojo. Um, so that was bad. Um, so it, it takes some things from Mojo, um, but the wire format is not particularly Mojo-y. I mean, Chromium on Fuchsia uses it to some extent, but it uses Mojo itself, I think, uh, I think um, for its own internal IPC, because it has to be cross-platform. Uh, in the same way that Chromium on Linux doesn't use Dbus or anything, it uses Mojo. Peter? The question was about talking about versioning and distributed systems and how that's scary. Uh, yeah, it does get scary. Um, versioning is relatively new and I haven't worked on it that much. Um, there is some work to be able to characterize the ABI of the ABIs um, as they change over time and then evaluate whether they are compatible or not and then reason about whether you can build a system with two components that speak different versions of an API based on whether the ABIs are considered compatible or not. I'm not sure where we are with that, but that's something that we're actively working on and people are thinking about. You're also doing that? Yeah, we should talk. I'll be here all week. Uh, at the ba second, yeah, you. Question is, is my laptop running Fusion right now? No, it's not. I should have actually done that. We have it running on laptops. I have a laptop on, on my desk at home that is not that is in software pieces, so I did not just do that. But I believe I could have done all this on Fuchsia, I think. Uh, the question was about which things um, are handled by the kernel versus on a per process basis, basically. So the kernel, the kernel provides this channel primitive, which is a bidirectional communication between two processes. You can write um, up to 64K bytes and 64 handles into a channel, one end of the channel, and it'll come out the other end. 
Um, and that's the primitive of the channel that the kernel provides um, for, for IPC that we are building this on. Everything else is done in, um, uh, in user space by, by, the, by libraries. Um, the kernel basically doesn't care about Biddle itself other than as the syscall interface. But for IPC, it's fairly agnostic to that. Is that an OK answer? Or? Um, the question was, this sounds like you could build a very good debuggable operating system with this and asking for stories. Um, yes and no. I mean, I think, so we have, we have a bunch of, um, um, we have these tools for, for, for observing everything. Um, you can't really observe all of the things all the time because, because everything is written in, is expressed in Fiddle. There's like a, a the, you end up, we end up hitting circular dependencies where we can't use Fiddle to d do Fiddle all the time. So you end up having to look at just a subset of, of processes running on your system. But it has been super useful in tracking down like, OK, why, what is this process doing? Who is it talking to? Like, um, there's been some um, experiments to build um, sort of dynamic visualizations of all the components in the system and who they're communicating to so that you can then like, visualize the actual topology of like the actual running system. Um, trying to think, I haven't got any good, any great debugging stories. Sorry, I'll uh, I'll think about that. Um, the question is about the comparison with gRPC and how our goals differed. Um, I am not that familiar with gRPC. Um, there's a guy who I used to work with who worked with us on Fiddle, um, who was one of the architects of gRPC. Um, he's I think back working on gRPC again. Um, and he helped design some things like the, the table type. Um, and some of his experience with doing gRPC at scale efficiently informed some of that design. Um, um, I think for us, I mean, the big difference between Fiddle and most other, like, uh, you know, interface definition languages is that they're mostly designed for networks and we're mostly designed for local. For, and so, um, those constraints end up showing up in all kinds of different ways. Um, I wish we could have reused something existing, but we didn't end up uh, in the middle there. Mm. Right. The question is, for performance reasons, do we end up having to re-implement things um, so that we can run them locally rather than making, IP making IPC calls? Um, and um, yeah, like there's always a performance cost, you know, even if you're local. Um, there's a context switch, there's some copies, like, you know, the MAC address example I gave, you're probably not going to write a, a fiddle component that is just there to parse and, and serialize MAC addresses. You're gonna write something that turns that data structure into a string in every language because it's just easier and, and more performant. Um, but it, and we've experimented with various ideas about how you can, um, ha what, what things should be out of process and what things should be in process. For a while, we were thinking that maybe you should do all your like HTTPS with a special service that was good at that, and we could make sure that it never had an old open SSL and, and all this kind of thing. But then you've got the question of like, well, that means that that process has access to your private data that in plain text, so maybe that you don't want that. So um, it's kind of an ongoing learning experience in building the operating system. Uh, the, the question was about whether uh, we're worried about the system a single part of the system growing very large, like a JVM that, that holds everything um, and how we're dealing with that. Um, so something I f mumbled over in the talk was about the fact that components and processes aren't the same. And so um, for Dart, what we actually do is we run a single Dart VM and then we run a bunch of Dart components within that same process that if they're like in a similar security domain basically, we're, sufficiently that we can trust that that VM is good enough, providing good enough security. So the component abstraction lets us um, deal with something like a VM that has a bunch of different bits of software running within it. Um, and, it and it can still fit into these abstractions that we've built. Um, and that separation is pretty valuable. Yeah, so the question was whether you could use Fiddle as a, um, as a FFI layer, essentially to allow you to, um, okay, I've got to wrap up in a sec. Um, maybe, like if you can do it out of process, definitely. In process, we've got some work on in process bindings, but 
Anyway, thank you very much, everyone.